Well, hello, my name is Aaron Torres. I'm with Cisco and I'm one of the technical uh, security architects with Cisco and we'll be going over how to configure a site-to-site -site VPN between a FortiGate and a Firepower 1010. All right, so what we're looking at right now is the dashboard of the FortiGate. But before I get into configurations or anything, I kind of want to set uh, the understanding of how this diagram looks. So on one hand, we have a FortiGate. On the other hand, we have a Firepower. And, and on the outside WAN interfaces of these both of these units, essentially, they have public interfaces, and meaning they have a, a static IP address from the ISP. Both on the inside have their own private, uh, unique networks. Uh, one might be 10, 10, 10. The other one might be 10, 20, 20, 20, right? Uh, but with what, the, what we're trying to accomplish here, in more in the real world environment, is how do we configure two different vendors uh, to do VPN between each other? It might be in a case where you might have a 40 gig data center or maybe in a virtual cloud or public cloud, and maybe you have a Firepower 1010 at a remote location, and you need to be able to gain access to the network behind this, let's say, for example, this virtual 40 gig or uh, this headquarters firewall, right? The whole point in a real world environment, not everybody may have the exact same vendor. All right, so let's get into this. I will go over the configuration of the FortiGate first, and you'll notice that I'll go to Network and then Interfaces. Under Interfaces, I'll just kind of go over how I configured this particular unit, and, and we'll kind of go over the configuration of the Firepower 2. You'll see here under Internal, I uh, configured 192.168.100.99 as the default network behind the internal. You'll notice that it has a hardware switch. Uh, I'm actually only using one port. It might be connected to another switch or maybe just uh, one device behind it. And over here in WAN 1, you'll notice that I have a public static IP address. Now, on the internal side, we have a DHCP. So anything that we connect to that internal network will have a DHCP address. Uh, but here, I have statically assigned a static uh, public IP address that I got from the ISP uh, directly into the FortiGate. You'll notice here in the FortiGate, uh, I've enabled access for me to reach this particular FortiGate and do testing like ping or SSH or HTTPS on this particular interface. And I've enabled the interface. But if I go back to uh, internal, you'll notice that it's a hardware switch uh, because this particular model allows me to have multiple internal ports uh, uh, as a member of like a bridge group, right? Uh, you'll see here that I can take members in and out of that uh, membership, you'll notice that I have uh, .99 is my gateway, which is the default for the FortiGate on the internal side. Uh, what access I want to enable and disable for the FortiGate from an administrative point of view. And I have also enabled the DHCP server for the inside of this interface. So any devices that are directly connected to this particular interface or this internal network will get a, an IP address from this particular range, okay? Uh, and then the interface is also enabled. The next thing I want to do is go to static routes. And then under static routes, you'll notice that I have an any and any route going to the public internet. Uh, and this particular IP address that we're seeing here is probably the router, the gateway of my public internet provider, right? And I'm using WAN1 and just saying that all traffic that I have uh, is destined for the internet. Uh, I don't have any other special configurations like SD-WAN or uh, explicit proxy or anything. So we're not gonna go through those today. Uh, but we will go over policy and objects. So you'll notice under IP version 4 policy, which is the configuration of the firewall rules or policies for the 48, uh, that I have a rule here saying internal to WAN 1. So any traffic that's part of the hardware switch, uh, which is um, the internal one port, uh, going to WAN 1, which we just specified being the internet access for the actual FortiGate itself, um, is, is going to be allowed. Uh, and, and we're saying all traffic on the inside and all traffic going to the outside on an always schedule uh, and all ports uh, are going to be accepted. Now, the one uh, thing that we noticed about FortiGate is that it allows a NAT statement not to be a separate policies. They're actually integrated into the actual firewall policies, which to me is very handy. It kind of helps me from an administration point of view specify um, you know, how NATs are working and kind of keep them in a, in a single centralized area. Uh, you'll see that you'll be able to measure the traffic and active sessions going into a particular rule. Okay. We're not going to be enabling any antivirus web filtering or DNS filtering in this particular um, policy. Um, we could, I, I highly suggest it. If you have traffic going out to the internet 
and um, you, you, and you want to be able to ensure security uh, in the FortiGate, you would enable these different options here: uh, antivirus, web filtering, application control, IPS. And at a later time, I'd be more than happy to show those to you. But why is that important? Because if we do create a fire a firewall policy for IPsec or for VPNs. Uh, you might m maybe want the the load of the of the encryption offloading or the AV or IPS to take uh, take place at the headquarters uh, instead of the remote location, right? Um, so meaning that if there was an infection or a compromise happen at a remote branch, uh, they would have to travel through the internet through the VPN tunnel to this particular headquarters, and that this unit here would capture that traffic and quarantine it or clean it. Uh, before it gain access to the data center or whatever's behind this particular firewall. That's one use case. Uh, obviously, you turn on um, security from the FortiGate as well as the Firepower. Uh, maybe we'll capture something on both ends that maybe the other vendor didn't capture. Uh, but the more you enable, the more you turn on, the less sessions and the less uh, amount of memory is available on these units to do that, what I would call deep back inspection when it comes to advanced security. Okay, so now let's go into the Firepower unit and kind of go over the, the basic configurations of this particular unit. You'll see under interfaces here uh, that I have uh, multiple interfaces just like we did in the FortiGate. Uh, we'll see here that we have what I would call Ethernet 1.1, which is the default WAN interface of the Firepower 1010. If we uh, edit that particular interface, you'll notice that I have that static address here uh, with a subnet associated to it. It's a routed interface and the status is enabled. And then you'll notice here that I am using a port uh, 1.8, okay? And 1.8 being the inside interface uh, of that actual firewall that we're using that we can connect a device to uh, to be able to get through that VPN tunnel. Now here you'll notice that um, I'm using an internal network of 192.168.111.1 uh, and a slash 24, and I'm also using a DHCP server uh, enabled uh, for that as well. Uh, it's a routed interface. Now, if you notice that I'm not using the bridge group or the hardware switch associated to the firepower, just to make it easier, I'm using a separate interface. So I took 1A out of the bridge interface and it kind of made it its own routed interface within the actual firewall itself. Okay, now we have that set up. Let's go to routing. Under routing, you'll notice that I have an any and any statement going to the gateway, and the gateway is dot two zero six. The one of the differences is here you specify host names or address objects um, for the networks and as well as the gateway. So those are things that you create on the fly or that you do predetermine before you go in here and configure it. So if we go to objects. Uh, go to networks, you'll notice that a lot of these things are specified in here. You'll notice that IP version 4 gateway is that 206 address, uh, the inside network um, address that we were using. So you might have to specify these or do it on the fly as you're making those configurations. And then um, some other things I want to point out here is under smart licensing. Uh, under smart licensing, we're using an evaluation uh, version of the uh, firepower. And you'll notice that the remote access VPN is not enabled. That's not something we're going over today, but the reason I bring that up is because we're not gonna be able to use some advanced encryption methods like 3DES. Um, so in this particular configuration that we're doing, we're using DES. But um, sure, you probably wanna go with a more stronger encryption um, and better uh, best practices, but because of the lack of licensing we have on both sides, we're just using simplistic uh, configuration. But those can be modified and changed at any given time. If you ha do have a smart account, and you can register the device, enter the token, and you can pay for the um, the update services and so on for the firepower so that you can get uh, the added encryption uh, methods into this particular unit itself. Now, let's jump back to the 48, and let's go over what I would call the VPNs, okay? Um, so the cool thing about a FortiGate is that they have wizards, and so does the Firepower 1010. But the one nice thing that I like about the FortiGate is that I can bring tunnels up and down uh, at any given time, and I'll show that to you here shortly. But what I want to do is kind of show you how to configure a site-to-site -site, uh, VPN between the FortiGate and the Firepower that works. Uh, and that allows us to route traffic through it. So they have an integrated wizard into the uh, the FortiGate. 
So let's, and I already have this all created, um, so I'm not gonna save this, but we'll go back and I'll show you the configuration for each. But for example, let's say the remote side is Austin Firepower, right? Uh, site to site, but there's a template array associated in the FortiGate that allows us to kind of use a, a predetermined template with P1, P2 proposals, uh, and we can modify those, okay? Uh, we have no NAT between sites because they're, you know, they both have static addresses. We go ahead and click next. Um, the IP address will be um, the actual IP address of the Firepower unit, and that's the WAN, WAN interface of the remote uh, device. And then the outgoing interface is WAN 1, which is the internet facing um, interface on the 48 reaching the internet. And then we'll, you know, for example, use whatever uh, pre-shared key you're using between both devices. Now, if we click next, uh, the local interface would be the internal. Uh, it would specify that internal address for us. But we also have to specify what is the remote um, IP address or network that's uh, behind the firepower, right? And then you're gonna have to do the reverse once we get to the other unit, the, the local internet, the local address to the firepower would be the 1110 and then the remote would be 110. But since we are behind the 40 gate right now, our local subnet is the 192.168.100.0 slash 24. And the network behind the uh, firepower is 192.168.111.0 slash 24. Okay. We go ahead and select, um, you know, create. Uh, once we do that, it go, ahead, it go ahead and creates what I would call the, um, the, the VPN tunnel, okay? Now, once we edit that particular tunnel, there will be a button up here, uh, and I already did it, so forgive me, that says convert to custom, because it's actually wrong. There, there are some changes that we need to do uh, because of the licensing that we have on both units will not match. So on the 40 gate side, I asked that on that button right up here, uh, which you don't see in this uh, particular screen, we'll say convert to custom. Once we convert to custom, we need to go through all the configuration here to make sure it matches to the defaults of the uh, firepower. For example, if I click on um, on edit for the network, you'll notice it has a static address, the remote peer address, the interface that's using on the outside. We're using NAT Universal, and that we're doing dead uh, peer detection on demand. Okay. Now let's go to authentication. We are using a pre-shared key. We're gonna use the same pre-shared key at both locations, but we are in this particular case gonna use Ike 1, okay? In a later video, I'd be more happy to show you how to do Ike 2, but just for simplistic reasons to get a tunnel up and running, we're gonna use Ike 1. We are doing main ID. Uh, when would you use main ID and aggressive? If We would use aggressive if we were behind an added address and we had to make it call out, but in this case, we're gonna use main ID on both both firewalls because there's both static addresses on both locations. P1 proposal, uh, we, uh, and forgive me, we're, we're not actually uh, changing uh, that. So I actually probably should cancel <laughs> and come uh, back into this. I don't wanna say that since we have this uh, tunnel already up and running. Uh, so going back to the P1 proposal, you'll notice that I have uh, DES and SHA-1. Of course, there are better options in here. Uh, such as 3 does and AES-256, uh, but be, as I explained before, because of the licensing, um, you know, we're going to just use DES for right now. But this is, you know, as long as they're matching on both sides, you should be just fine. Uh, we're using DES, SHA-1 for authentication. We're using uh, Duffy Hellman Group 14 and the Key Life 86400. Uh, and then we'll go down to two, P2 Proposal. Uh, here, the wizard automatically created the local and the remote uh, object names with those IP address subnets that we use. So you, we can go back and take a look at those um, and you'll say local address, remote address. But when you click on advanced, uh, there are some changes here that you probably have to make. Uh, for example, encryption being DES, uh, authentication being SHA-1, um, enabling replay detection, PFS is enabled 14, and then the seconds. You, uh, you would make those changes, uh, save them. Now there's a couple of other things that we have to specify that are, that are working before we bring uh, everything back up. So let's go to what I call addresses, right? Just to make sure that those addresses are done correctly, that we didn't do any uh, typos or whatever, but the wizard created the local subnet and the remote subnet, okay? So those were added in here and you'll notice that it went ahead and created these address groups. 
And the reason why I create these address groups is because in the future, if you need to add a different um, subnet into them, it's easier to just create the object and put it into um, those address groups than having to recreate a whole new VPN tunnel. We can add them to the exact, the exact uh, existing VPN tunnel. Now let's go to IP version policy. So there's a difference between uh, what I call route-based and policy-based VPNs. And what the wizard did, it created what I call a route-based VPN. So the encryption is being done from an interface versus the policy, okay? And a policy-based VPN, uh, you would probably put action encrypt uh, from, a, from a policy perspective. But in the FortiGate, in this particular route-based VPN, we can route things, kind of like a GRE tunnel, right? Uh, we can route things over this particular uh, virtual interface. And I'll kind of show you what that looks like. But let's look at the policies. And since it's a route-based VPN, there has to be an, an out exit and an inch and a, you know, like kind of going out and in, inbound. Okay, so you'll notice that we're using this um, virtual interface it creates for IPsec called FDM Austin, uh, going to our internal network, and then we have internal going to this virtual interface called FDM Austin. Okay, so here we'll edit it. You'll notice that it, it shows the interface, it shows uh, the internal, and then the virtual interface. It shows those networks that we have that are remote and local. Uh, and you'll notice here it says accept, not IPsec, because again, this is a tunnel-based, uh, a route-based VPN, not a policy-based VPN. If we were creating a policy-based VPN, you would select IPsec, but in this case, we are not doing that, okay? There is no need for NAT because since we're doing routing, we're routing that traffic over these virtual interfaces and we're not uh, doing policy, okay? Uh, and then if you go look at the other policy, uh, you'll notice here, um, the same thing, um, but it's just in a different direction. So now it's going local to remote. Uh, again, it's accepting and we're not doing any natting. And the, the one thing I want you to notice here is that you'll notice that some traffic is being generated from one direction to the other. Now you notice here where it says log UTM, we can log any uh, connections, but we also can attach what I call security policies uh, to the traffic on the VPN. So if you want to apply web filter, antivirus, or DNS filter application control, you can. Does it make sense is the question. The more you add to a policy from a security perspective, the slower and the more resources are going to be used within that uh, that box or that solution, right? Uh, but if you have the resources to do it, why not? Uh, if you're forcing all internet traffic to go through this policy, then you might want to configure web, uh, web filtering and specify what you want to allow or block. Okay. Uh, now, since this is a route-based VPN, let's go take a look at those particular static routes that we have going through that virtual interface. Okay. Uh, you'll see here we have all traffic going to a black hole unless specified going to the FDM uh, Austin. Okay. And FDM Austin is what we call the firepower unit. All right. Uh, so you'll see here that anything that's destined for that remote traffic, that 192.168.111.0/24 is destined to go through this interface, all right? So anything on the internal network that's destined for that network would be routed through this virtual interface. So let's go look at that virtual interface. So if you look under WAN1, you'll notice that we have FDM uh, Austin. It's a virtual interface. And if we wanted to give it an IP address and allow people to administer the 40 gate if we, to you know, change configuration, we could. Uh, or we could you know, make this like an OSPF route or you know a BGP peer or whatever. We definitely could. But in this case, we're not. Um, we're just creating just a site-to-site -site VPN. All right. Uh, now, let before I come back here, let's go through the configuration side of the Firepower unit. Okay. From the configuration side, uh, from the fire, uh, from the firepower unit through what we call FDM, which is the firepower device manager, uh, it's an on-box on -box management for the firepower units. Um, again, as I stated, we're using an evaluation license, so we do we do not have the advanced encryption or advanced security feature uh, for the firepower to use three DES. We're just using DES. Okay, um, you go to site site configuration. Under site to site configuration, uh, you can go ahead and click uh, add and you'll be able to be, be taken through a wizard to configure this. Uh, obviously, you'll be naming it. So if we wanted to, again, I'm just going to go through a, a test configuration, but I've already pre-configured this uh, test. And then ob obviously the local uh, VPN access interface, right? Uh, and, and, and essentially that's going to be the, the dirty internet connection, right? And then you also specify what is the remote IP address of the FortiGate uh, that we're trying to reach, okay? And that's a 205 address, and this is static, okay? 
uh, the local network, uh, which is our network, right, uh, which is here local to us, uh, which would be um, in this particular case, the inside network eight network because I'm behind interface eight. Um, and then here the remote network uh, will be the, the the network that I have over there. Now, I usually hate watching videos and they don't explain what that means. And I explained it in the 48, but I'll explain it in the firepower. The inside eight network, local network, is the local network behind my interface eight on my firepower unit. My local network is 192.168.111.0 slash 24. That's where my PC sits. The remote network is 192.168. I believe it was 100.0 slash 24. That is the local network on the other side of the 40 gate. Okay. So it so we're basically saying what's my local network and what's the remote local network. All right. Now, once we click next, it's going to ask us, uh, you know, Ike version two or Ike version one. We're going to do Ike version one just for simplistic reasons. Okay. Now, this is where it gets a little bit trickier because of the licensing. It does. This doesn't reflect everybody. If you do have a full blown license, you don't have to follow this method. Uh, but if you don't and you just want to get a site site VPN tunnel up and running, you definitely can follow this method. Uh, in this case, we're using what I call SHA DES Group 14 Pre Shared Key ID. Okay. But you do have various other options in here from AES uh, 256 to 3DES to uh, using certificates, uh, however you want to configure that. Uh, but in this particular case, we're using pre-shared key um, does group 14. Now, from a IPsec proposal, um, you know, we have to add one. And the one that we, we added was the DES SHA. Now, if you had the licensing, you want to, you know, go and create one and say three DES SHA or whatever, you definitely could. But I created one called the DES SHA because I know that that's what we're using on the other location. The pre-shared key, you type in the uh, key that you have shared uh, between both locations. Uh, and then I'm going to exempt uh, NAT. Uh, now, what I mean by uh, exempting that is that there there is no reason why I need to have traffic uh, going uh, to a particular location, right? And, and so, what I what I really mean by that is that a no NAT statement it means that we're not going to use NAT to be routed through the internet. It enable um, pr uh, PFS uh, Duffy Hellman Group 14 on the other location, so we should uh, select that. We click next, and then it pretty much completes um, that particular tunnel that we just created. Okay, so it will show up here, and I'm going to go ahead and edit this uh, tunnel just to kind of show you how it looks like. Uh, again, it's outside. That's our WAN interface. This is our uh, external WAN IP address of the 48 inside network, the remote network. Uh, then we have, we're using Ike version one, the uh, proposals for uh, Ike version one policy, right? I'm using DES group 14 pre-shared key. Um, now I'm using over here, uh, I use a custom one, the 48 uh, DES SHA. I created that to be honest with you. Um, and then uh, the pre-shared key that we have shared between both uh, firewalls. I selected no NAT, um, and that actually might be wrong, I do apologize, the no NAT inside eight. Um, so I, I probably need to go check and, and make sure that's working correctly. Uh, and then the Definitely Hellman 14, right? I click next uh, and then it allows you to review the actual configuration um, and it allows me to see uh, how everything's working, how everything's running. You'll see that you know the NAT exempt, the uh, Ike, Ike policies, the authentication type and et cetera. I click finish and then we're done. At that point, uh, we have one more step. We have to go to policies. And from a policy perspective, I have to create a policy. You click up here at the right hand corner uh, and select, you know, where, what, how you want traffic to flow. Right. And in this particular case, I have a policy already created. Uh, and in this particular policy, I'm saying inside eight, which is the zone associated to port eight. My network is the inside eight, which is the 192.168.1110 network is destined for the outside. Right. Uh, and then uh, the, the remote uh, Austin network. And I go ahead and click on um, allow or trust. Okay? I trust all traffic to go through that particular case. Now, again, you can create your own uh, intrusion protection or, or policies that you want to scan traffic going to that particular network. But in this case, we're not going to do that. We're just creating a policy uh, site to site. Uh, 
under monitoring, uh, here you have the ability to look all the events and everything that are going on associated to the firepower unit. Uh, but the one thing I want to bring up, if you do have problems uh, getting it on the fly, creating the Ike policies for Ike version 1 or Ike version 2, you go to Objects and then you go to Ike Policies. And under Ike Policies, you can create um, what you need that's custom for your location. I did have to do this. I did have to create one. Um, and you could put the priority, the name, the, you know, the AES, uh, you know, DES, 3DES, whatever it might be. Uh, is it pre-shared key certificate, Duffy Hellman Group, uh, Shaw, or Lifetime associated to it? And sometimes uh, if you're working with a third-party vendor, uh, depending on who it is, those lifetimes might be different, right? In this case, we have control over both firewalls, so we can change that or just use the defaults. But sometimes you might be working with a cloud provider. Sometimes you might be working with a vendor uh, that has changed it. And so you have to match those statements. You, you want the flexibility to be able to modify those if needed to from, one, from at least one location. Now, uh, let's bring this tunnel up. The one cool thing about FortiGate is that you can bring tunnels up uh, on the fly. Uh, so if you see here under IPsec tunnels, uh, I can click on the tunnel. Uh, you'll see it's inactive. I can click on it and actually select it and say bring up. Uh, bring up all phase two selectors or just you know the one associated to that and you'll see here uh, that we have uh, the FDM uh, trap the FDM tunnel between the 40 gate and the firepower is up okay now how do I go and validate that uh, traffic's actually flowing through this right a lot of times if you're doing this remote you know uh, you may not be on site you may not be able to see traffic, right? Uh, so a lot of times having uh, access to the dashboard. Now both units can do this. Uh, you have CLI access to both units, um, you know, but here in this case, there's a, a built-in uh, sniffer into the 40 gate. Um, and let me uh, type that out. And then, um, the, and then the virtual interface. So let me explain uh, kind of what I'm doing here. So Diag Sniffer Packet, which is basically kind of a TC dump. And then the virtual interface we're looking at is FDM uh, slash Austin, okay? We could do this for WAN 1. We could do this for internal. We could do this for any physical interface. But since we have an actual virtual slash physical interface that was created, any traffic that goes through that interface will start capturing here. So we could validate if traffic is actually getting through it. Um, and, and a lot of times, that's a great troubleshooting tool for me because a lot of times I'll tell the remote people, hey, can you ping this address? Like my machine is on the opposite side of that tunnel. Uh, and then I'll pull this up. And, and sometimes I'll see the ping only going one way and not going the other way. They're like, well, I can't ping it. I go, well, you know what? I see it. So maybe your Windows firewall is enabled. You have to disable that in order for it to reply. And a lot of times that's it. And they disable their host firewall. Next, you know, their replies are going through. But if that doesn't happen, that at least gives us the packet capture or the PCAPs to be able to identify, you know, in real time what problems are happening, right? Uh, another troubleshooting tool we have uh, under log and report is here we have VPN events, right? And under a VPN events allows us to see the proposals, um, you know, into the FortiGate, allows us to see the inbound, outbound, you know, and so on. And you'll see here probably from last night when I was configuring this, uh, some errors or and the errors were allowing me to see kind of where, where I was having problems. So, but you'll be able to see pretty much the success and the failures and the tunnel statistics uh, from this. Uh, and you'll see when like phase two goes down and et cetera. But anyways, in a nutshell, uh, guys, I, there's a lot more I can cover. Uh, obviously there's a lot more troubleshooting and CLI troubleshooting I can do uh, probably uh, from the uh, Firepower 2 as well. Kind of showing you, you know, how do I go about troubleshooting from a CLI perspective? How do I identify if, if a certain P1 or P2, P2 proposal are failing? Um, I will do that in a later video, um, more of an advanced video. But the purpose of today was really just to show you a quick and dirty, how do I get a, a, a basic VPN tunnel up and running between a 48 and a Firepower, right? Uh, I know there's a lot of demand on, well, now that I got up and running, I want to route traffic through it. I want to be able to uh, troubleshoot problems more in the advanced video, and I'd be more than happy to do that. But the purpose of this video is essentially just gain that tunnel up. So I hope you um, learned a lot, and if you have any questions or ever want to reach out, feel free to subscribe to the channel. We'd be more than happy to uh, show you more. Uh, we have tons of great things on this YouTube channel, and we're looking forward to you guys learning. Thank you.